Good morning. It's good to see you all. You having a good morning? Smile for me real big if you're having a good morning. God is good all the time. Well, hey, um, were there some announcements I had to give? I don't think so. Thank you for your faithful giving, your stewardship. Um, your faithfulness during this time is commendable. And uh, we know that the church is not a building, and the church is not a worship service. The church is much greater than that. That is the body of Christ coming together and serving and loving each other and serving the world and pointing people to Jesus. Um, and, but, you know, we, we, when we give money, it's not because the church is raising an offering or raising funds. Really, I think in many ways, the offering is a way to raise us up in our faithfulness, is that it is a tool that God uses to help us to put Him first. And so for that, um, thank you. Our church financially is strong. Our church spiritually is strong. And uh, I appreciate that and want to commend you for sure. Holding uh, these little babies reminded me of when we took our little baby, our firstborn, Nathan, who's about to graduate from high school which is hard to believe, some 18 years ago, over 18 years ago. And, uh, you know, when we brought him home, uh, we made preparations for him, right? And we made a lot of changes in the house and our lifestyle when you bring a baby into the home. There are signs and symbols of babies, all, baby all around when you come into the household of a family with a newborn, right? I mean, we had, uh, we, we, Sarah and I were both driving really junky cars at the time, and we said, you know what? Our cars are not dependable. Um, we need to get rid of one. We need to buy a more dependable car because um, we couldn't be stuck on the side of the road with a little infant. So we did that. Um, we had an office and a guest bedroom that suddenly became a, a nursery, a children's room. And so we filled it with the crib. We took out the office space. We filled it with the crib. We took out the books and put um, places to store diapers um, I mean, there, there are signs, when, when you bring a baby in the household, there are signs in, of, of, a, of a baby everywhere. I mean, our fridge changed, how we, um, our sleeping patterns changed. Uh, just, just about everything was different because we bought a, brave, a baby in the home. And, uh, and if you, if someone came over to our house and uh, did not know that we had an infant, didn't know we had a baby, they could see just from things around the house, things around the room, that we did have a baby in the house. It wouldn't take them that long because they're just signs of a baby. In this series, Way Truth Life, Discipleship as a Journey of Grace, we've been talking about the grace of God. And we've talked about how God's grace um, knocks on our heart's door, that that's provenient grace, that provenient grace is God reaching out to his loved ones, his, his children, his people. And we are told in Scripture that if we open up our heart's door, if we open up our life to Him, that He will not hesitate but enter in and become a part of our life. And what He'll do is He'll save us. As a Christian, a Christian word, right? You say, save from what? You know, what am I at risk of? We talked about that a couple weeks ago, that we all have sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That sin is not something that just sends us to hell. Sin is something that makes hell a part of our life. That when we sin, we invite, just like when we open up our heart's door to Jesus, he comes in. When we sin, we open up our life to hell. <laughs> and the consequences of hell and death come in. And you know that. You know that when you, even the slightest sin, when no one even knows about it, you feel condemnation, you feel guilt, you feel hell. And so we need saved from that, that we need to be made whole like what Christ created us to be made whole at the very beginning. And so when we say yes to provenient grace and open up God's, our heart's door to Jesus and we allow him to come in to our life, we're saved. We're saved from the consequences of sin. We're saved from death. We're saved from destruction. That is God's saving grace. Last week, Pastor Dave talked about justification, which is a big, like, Big word, theological word, just simply means that God looks at us as if we've never sinned, that we are in right relationship with God. Like it is mind-blowing when we say yes to Jesus. He no longer sees us in our fallen nature, but he actually sees us as whole and sinless. However, there is a 
sanctifying work that takes place, and this, this happens slow. Justification happens in the moment, but sanctification, sanctifying grace happens gradually. We say that God loves us so much, he'll accept us where we are, but he loves us so much, he won't leave us there. And so he's got this work, this gr- the grace of God is doing a work and shaping us. We're like clay in his hands, and he's shaping us to look more like him because he wants to use us to be grace givers in the world around us. He loves the world, and he, des- he, he commissions us to then be instruments of God's grace in the world around us. So we've been talking about sanctifying grace. And just like car seats and cribs and diapers and exhausted parents are a sign of a baby entering a family, what are the signs of Jesus entering into a person's life? What are the things that someone should say, even if you never say, hey, I'm a a Christian, But someone sees you and says, oh, there's something different about them. There's signs that God is doing something in their life. That's sanctifying grace. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 2. It's a really popular scripture verse. And uh, let me me say this. We've been following um, a teaching and a book that's written by Dr. Busick. And if you haven't picked up that book yet, we have... We have them in the courtyard. We have them at the welcome desk. And it's a really, really good book. And I would encourage you to pick it up. It's only $5. And, and some of you have been reading through it. I hope you have. But um, don't use this as an excuse. Well, we're coming to the end of the series. I'm not going to, you know, it's too late to start reading that. Don't. No, that book is worth reading. Um, it's worth getting and picking up. It's only $5. And you'll, you'll be glad that you picked it up and you start reading it. And so... We're going to talk through this passage in Acts 2, starting at verse 42. So go ahead and get your Bibles up. Hold it up. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. It is God's holy word. It is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And uh, starting at verse 42, Acts 2, 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals including the Lord's Supper and a prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place. They shared everything that they had. They sold their property and their possessions, and they shared their money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in their homes for the Lord's Supper They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. I want to talk first. Have you ever lost your way? Anyone lose your way? You you think you're going one place and then you turn. I mean, one of my most frustrating lose my way stories. I'll try to make it short. I don't want to take up too much time, but um, I was coming back. My buddy and I love the Iowa Hawkeye football team, and uh, he calls me, and he says, hey, uh, here in a couple weeks, we're living in Kansas City. He said, here in a couple weeks, they're playing Penn State in Happy Valley. You and I, we're going, and I was, okay, sign me up. It's about a 16-hour drive, and so we leave at 10 p.m. one day on Friday, The game is supposed to be at noon the next day, and we drive all throughout the night from Kansas City to Happy Valley, and we get there about, it it turned out the game got bumped, so we, it was supposed to be like afternoon, two or three, and it got bumped to a late evening game, so we get there, um, 16 hours on the road, we get there, we have some time to go walking around, finally the game comes, we go to the game, the Hawkeyes won, (laughs) which made the drive back so much better. And then after the game, it was about midnight, and we started driving home, switching off and on. It's about 3 in the morning. We're on I-70, heading west, and there's a sign that said um, Pittsburgh, all right, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh 76, but you had to stay straight on 70, because it's 70, 76, you had to stay straight, or you could take an off-ramp and stay on 70 and take you toward Kansas City. It's 3 a.m. in the morning, I'm driving along. 
for some reason, I thought, well, I need to stay on this road. I mean, it's 70 the whole way, so I don't take the exit. Uh, about a mile in, I've realized I'm heading to Pittsburgh. I don't want to go to Pittsburgh. I want to get up back on 70. I said, no, no problem. My buddy's asleep. I'm not going to bother him. I'll let him sleep. Next sign says, I, this is a toll road, so it's not, a toll roads don't have little off ramps all the time. And so the sign says, next off ramp, 19 miles. Oh, gosh, that's like a long way. That's all right. It's a 16-hour trip, not a problem. uh, 19 miles is not going to be a problem. I get to the off-ramp, get off, pay the toll, another five bucks to get back on, and I have to get 19 miles back to the off-ramp to where I was taking a turn. It's like, I'm on my way. I'm doing fine. It's just 40 minutes of my time. It's not a big deal. I get spun around. I start cruising. I'm like, I'm not going to miss this turn. I'm not going to miss this turn. I can see it. I can see it. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I get to the exit. I miss it again. I'm screaming at myself. I'm screaming in the car. My buddy Donnie goes, what's going on? I said, I missed it again. We're going to spend an hour and a half in $10. <laughs> But we made it home. Have you ever lost your way? This book talks about wrong turns that people take on the journey of grace. And there are quite a few wrong turns on the journey of grace, but it talks about four wrong turns. And the first one it talks about is legalism. Legalism is the belief that as long as we follow all the right rules and behaviors, we will stay on the right path of this journey of grace. So the problem is, is that grace was a free gift. And if we become so focused on the rules of our faith instead of Jesus, we detour off the journey of grace and we find ourselves in a very bad place. Legalism, listen to this. For those of you that like to, the checklist, all the do's and the don'ts and the yeses and the no's and make sure that you look like the right Christian, legalism can never sustain a meaningful journey of grace. The next wrong turn on the journey of grace is knowledge, knowledge base. And this is the understanding or the belief that as long as we have the right information and we know all the right stuff, then we'll be able to stay on the journey of grace. So people spend so much of their time and their lives learning and defending and arguing truths. And they argue that it's about right interpretation of the Bible and right theological doctrines, and right knowledge. But the problem is, right knowledge without the right heart will leave us wanting on the journey of grace. Another off-ramp or wrong turn is experience, or you might call it the mountaintop experience. This is when you're in a moving moment, and your heart is stirred, all right? And you have this, this cathartic experience, this moment where you just feel close to God. You feel like you're in the presence of God. And these moments are great, especially for baby Christians. If you're like a baby Christian, these kind of moments, if I, I remember when these moments, I was a teenager, and I, I remember these moments happening a lot when I'd go to youth group. And then I'd come home from camp or youth group or something, I'm like, oh, God's not here. Where's God? It's like I was moving from moment to moment, experience to experience. This is the wrong turn. Because if you are, you know this, mature Christians, it's not about feelings. That feelings will leave you lost and confused when it comes to faith. Here's another one, and I'm sure there's more, but they talk about the super spirituality. And this is, if you believe, all you need to do is get alone, read your Bible, pray enough, volunteer enough for enough ministries, then that will do. We attach, attack our spirituality with the same vigor soldiers attack their training. And we become obsessed about our quiet time. We beat ourselves up about perceived failures and disciplines. And this will leave you defeated on the journey of grace. I'm sure there are others, but these are just four that they talked about. I want to talk just briefly and define the word means of grace, this phrase, means of grace. Means of grace is, uh, so this is taken from Holiness Today. This is our Nazarene uh, magazine that we produce. And this this is what means of grace means. A means of grace. These are things that we do or participate in 
which open us up to God and position us so that we might draw closer to God. Then God graciously works through them to transform us and make us more like Christ. All of this by faith and by faithful observance. So we talk about in this, in this journey of grace, we talk about means of grace. The means of grace is something that we put ourselves in a, into a position of or a posture of to receive the grace of God. That we don't earn it, we don't deserve it, we just, and, and we, we, we sometimes we call communion. Communion is a means of grace. That communion, taking the cup, taking the bread, this is a place we put ourselves in a posture to receive the grace of God. God's grace is, is always available and it's always free. But sometimes when it comes to our walk with God, we're shut off to God's love we're, for whatever reason. But when we step into this means of grace, we have this hand out and say, God, I need you. This Acts 2 passage gives us um, kind of a posture in which the Christian can receive the grace of God. And I'll talk about three things, postures when it comes to, and we're talking about sanctifying grace, God's changing, transforming grace in our life. The first thing is these people, the early Christians, were committed to the Scriptures. It says they were committed to the apostles' teaching. For us, it's the Bible. We have this great gift that's been passed on to us, this story of God and his interaction with his people. They put, the early believers, put more faith and trust in the apostles' teaching than in any other source. I want you to listen. We live in a time where we're bombarded by information. I can get on my phone and depending on the news outlet, I can find all sorts of stuff to justify how I feel, how I think, how I behave. We have more information and news and angling now than ever before. And sadly, in the church, we have put more faith and trust and hope in information given to us by some other source than the Word of God. And it has caused us to, instead of loving people and caring for people and seeking the best for our own fam church family and people outside the church family, has actually caused us to be anxious and build animosity toward people. And it's dangerous. It's, da it's dangerous when you start to listen to all sorts of stuff. And, and I'm not saying you shouldn't read the news. Fine, read the news. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I mean, it's good to be informed. Uh, some of what I'm saying. I'm saying this needs to be the first thing you think about in the morning and the last thing you think about when you lay your head down at night. And this, this is another thing. This is to be read in community. I know a lot of people that have grabbed the Bible uh, closed their doors and started reading and formed all sorts of goofy ideas that have actually led to dangerous stuff that's caused damage if the Word of God is not read and processed and digested in community. This is not a tool that you use to prove that you're right. This is not a tool that you use to hit someone over the head to make them, you know, filled with shame or guilt. This is something that is to be used to not for information, but for personal transformation. Don't read something and say, oh, I'm going to tell my wife this. No, you read this and say, oh, God, what are you saying to me? How are you trying to shape me through this? And the Holy Spirit that knocked on your heart's door, God's provenient grace, and Jesus, the Spirit of God that saved you, is the same Spirit of God that will bring transformation in your life through a spirit through the word, when we process it, digest it in community. They were committed to that. Are you? Two, they were committed to shared life together. The journey of grace does not, is not a walking alone. 
Christian life is never to be lived in isolation. Sometimes when you think about sanctifying grace or you think about becoming holy, in my mind, it's like the monk on the monastery on the top of the mountain. That's not holiness. I could be on the top of the mountain with my Bible up there by myself and read the scripture that I should love my enemy, that I should think of others before myself, that I should love my neighbor as myself, and intellectually I can say, I agree, I agree, I agree, but I don't know if I truly agree until I'm rubbing shoulders with my neighbor and my enemy. Acts chapter 2 is a beautiful picture of shared life together. And it is true, as iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. And they did things that seemed like ordinary, normal things, like they ate meals together. I can come to church, and I can put on a smile, and I can dress in my Sunday best, and I can deceive everyone and have everyone think that everything's going well in my life. But when I invite you over to my house and we sit down for dinner, it's a little bit harder to hide. They were vulnerable with each other. It says that they had everything in common, which doesn't mean that they didn't argue or have differences. No, they had plenty of differences. Look at Acts chapter 4. There are plenty of differences. And there is a, but the difference was is they were so committed to unity that even in the midst of their differences, they didn't run. They didn't say, no, that's going to be a hard conversation. I'd, I'd rather just avoid No, they were committed to unity. They heard Jesus say in John 13, 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. What will prove to the world that we are his disciples? Our love for each other. Let me say it again. Our love for each other. Let me ask you a question. What will prove to the world that we are his disciples? Our love, say it with me, our love. Jesus prayed for that in John 17, 20 through 21. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples. So he first prays for himself because he's about to go to the cross. Then he's praying for his disciples. And now he's praying for those who believe because of his disciples. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who ever believe in me through their message. So he's praying for us. I pray that they will be all be one, just as you and I are one. Do you think? Jesus and the Father were close, and he prayed that that's the same kind of relationship that we would have. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. It seemed Jesus valued unity. And Paul says that we're a body. The church is a body. Compares it to like a human body. And he says, um, you know, if, if one part suffers, they all suffer. Have you ever, like, had a hangnail? You didn't think much about your fingernails until you had a hangnail. Then that's all you could think about. And that's like the church. If anyone in uh, in our body is struggling or suffering, then we should all care passionately to make sure that it's better. They were committed to each other. And Jesus' authenticity, his reputation was at stake. How are people going to know? That we're his disciples? How are people going to know that Jesus is the real deal? Unity was big for Jesus, it would seem. Final thing, they committed to practicing grace giving. Committed to the practice of grace and giving it to others. So, um, this book that I've talked about, uh, Way Truth Life, Dr. Busick was talking about his, uh, his piano playing prowess, and he was, uh, he was saying, you know, when he was a young boy, he loved sports, and he uh, enjoyed football in particular, and he wanted to play football all the time, but his mom said, no, you can't, you can't just do sports, and so she made him take piano lessons, and so he said, I didn't like it, I didn't enjoy it, but I did it so I could play football. And uh, he said, I would practice a lot under my mom's watchful eye, right? He said, I just, I had to do it. I was a little boy, and I was in my mom's, you know, care, and so I had to practice piano. He said, when I got old enough that, uh, you know, she wasn't really, she she let me quit. He said, I quit playing piano. I quit taking lessons. 
And so um, he says occasionally he'll still play piano. He'll play like once a year. Usually it's over the holidays. And uh, he says uh, when someone comes to him and asks him how long he's been playing piano, he has to tell them like over 40 decades, or four decades, excuse me, over 40 years. But then the little caveat is, I know 12-year-olds that can play circles around me because he just hasn't been practicing piano. There's a passage in Hebrews chapter 5 I want us to look at. The author of Hebrews is, he's challenging his church. And he says, you've been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching one another. You ought to be teaching others. He said, you've been a Christian so long that just, you should be instructing others. Instead, he's getting in their business, he says, instead, You need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. He's angry. He says, you're like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, those who training, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Chapter 6, verse 1, so let us stop going over the basic things about Christ again and again, and let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. He's saying, you've been been Christians for a long time, but you haven't been practicing. And in here in Acts chapter 2, you see that they practiced hospitality, they practiced prayer together. They practiced generosity with each other. They practiced studying the word together. They didn't, you've heard, um, maybe you've heard this illustration, the difference between a, um, a cruise liner and an aircraft carrier. An aircraft carrier is, uh, well, a cruise liner, you have about 5% of the people that are on the ship that are just working their tails off and they're exhausted trying to meet the needs of the other, like, 95% of the people on the ship. And the mission of a cruise liner is to make sure that those who paid the money, um, their trip is comfortable, they're entertained, that they're well-fed, and that they're happy. And so you've got that, the cruise liner, and then you have this aircraft carrier where everyone has a job, everyone has a responsibility, Everyone is putting in the time and effort. And the mission is not for the people that are on the boat. The mission is to accomplish the task that is ahead of them. And, of course, the illustration applies to the church. Christians, the church should look more like the aircraft carrier and less of the cruise liner. That we all have gifts and strengths and abilities to be used to glorify God and to care for each other. And that's what they're, they practiced it. you got to practice. You say, what are my spiritual gifts? Well, practice spiritual gifts. Be generous and discover if you have the spiritual gift of generosity. We're all to be generous. Some, certain people have this extra spiritual gift of generosity. Uh, some of you have this dynamic ability to teach but you haven't really practiced or stepped into the realm of practicing teaching. And so you're going to be, you might be a Christian for 40 years, but really people that are like 12 years old can run circles around you. Practice. In your, um, on your seat, there's a little card. And when it comes to everyone have a card, it should be on your seat. This is for you. This is just for you to take home. And um, on this card, there's, uh, it's entitled Discipling Relationships. So this hits at the fact that Christianity is not to be done in isolation. That you are to practice praying for each other and practice um, 
encouraging each other and practice hospitality together. This is not, we're not alone rangers in this thing. And there's two questions. Do you have someone who disciples you? And this word disciple is, um, there's, there's, um, you're going to hear us say, who's your Paul and who's your Timothy? These are two characters in the scriptures. Paul ministered to and discipled Timothy. Paul is a mature believer that was pouring into Timothy. And then, in turn, Timothy looked up to Paul as his like, disciple, but then Paul had other people that were pouring in him, and, and Timothy poured into other people. It's this discipling relationship. And the question is, do you have someone who disciples you and are you discipling someone? Are you pouring into someone? This last summer, I um, had to get in shape because I went to officer training school. And uh, I was spending, I spent a lot of time in preparation for officer training school because I knew that I had to be able to run uh, a mile and a half at a certain speed. And so I was running in preparation for it. Then I got to the school and we, uh, we took a, a test, the first test. And the first test was just to give you a baseline. And uh, my goal, in order to pass, I didn't have to run a mile and a half, and it wasn't impressive. It was like 14 minutes, which most people can do that, I think. But, um, but I, to get 100% on the mile and a half, and I just wanted to knock it out of the park, right? I was going to shoot for 100%. It wasn't a problem with the push-ups and the sit-ups. That was, I was able to get that without a problem. But the mile and a half was going to be a challenge because I had to get it in like 9 minutes and 45 seconds which I'm sure some of you could do that. But for me, that was going to be hard to get it in 9 minutes and 45 seconds. And, uh, and I took the first test, and I got 10 minutes and 15 seconds. It's like, oh, man, I'm going to have to knock 30 seconds off this mile and a half. That's, that's going to be hard because 10 minutes and 15 seconds felt like I was pushing to the edge. And my roommate, his name was uh, Griff, Griffin Durup. He was a med student. He's like 23 year, three years old, so he's like 20 years younger than me. And he was quick. And he got it in like 9 minutes and 15 seconds. And I said, hey, uh, Griff, I want to run with you. Like, can we run? Can we daily run? And... Uh, you're going to help me. Will you help me? Will you? I, I asked Griff. I said, hey, I want you to set the pace. All right, you run like you run, and I'm going to try to keep up with you. And I couldn't. I, I couldn't hardly at all. I mean, we did that uh, every other day for because at the end of the two months, I was going to have to take the other test. I want to get it. And I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And... Uh, I never did keep up with Griff, and I didn't get 945. I got 948. I wish I would have. I wish I would have timed myself because I think I could have gotten three more seconds off. But I got a lot farther and faster than I would have if I was just on my own. And that's really this question: is who's your running mate in the faith? Who is someone that you look up to and say, "I see them." I see they, they have a faith and a love for Jesus that I admire. And then you have the, the big ask. Hey, will you be my running mate? Will you set the pace? Can I, can I watch and learn from you? Can I grow from you? And then Christianity is a, is a gift that's given to us that we then pass on to the next generation. And if someone, and, and look for that person that's hanging around you a little bit and say, hey, let's pray, to, let's start praying together. Let's start practicing faith together. And so as this is in your hands, this is, this is for you, but I want you to consider it. And I, if you have a pen or a pencil, grab it. I'm going to leave some space before we dismiss and allow the Spirit, the Spirit is speaking to you.
Lord, we praise you that we're not in this alone. You told the disciples, never will I leave you or forsake you. You told them when you told them to go and make disciples, you'll be with us to the very end of the age. Lord, we're mindful of the fact when you dismissed or commissioned the disciples, you sent them out in twos. I pray for our church. Lord, we're grateful that we're welcoming babies, new little babies. And then we're also reminded of the um, significance of that. Significance of life on life and people watching and, and that this world is watching. And this world will know that you are the Messiah by the way we love and care for each other. We're moving our place. We're grateful for this snapshot of a healthy church. Lord, may there be examples just bubbling up in this fellowship of your Holy Spirit work. So when people see us, they'll say, there's something different. That Jesus must be real. Lord, I pray for that person that's here that's really discouraged right now. Lord, draw close to them. I pray for that person that just feels really broken. Maybe because of relationships or health or emotions. Lord, bring healing to them in the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray. You added to their number daily. Lord, this is not a marketing campaign. We're trying to get more people to buy the widgets. Lord, may the genuine love that we have for each other and our love for you be inspiring to others so others might desire to know you and to have their sins forgiven and their brokenness healed. Lord, move in our place. Um, I feel compelled to um, offer anointing this morning. If there's anyone in our church at the end of the service that would like to be um, anointed and prayed over, uh, you can come on up and we'll do that. Lord, we love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand. Uh, mothers, make sure you grab the flowers out in the courtyard. Don't leave without grabbing a, some flowers. And say this with me. Love God, live as a family, and go and make disciples.